what the kinds of push starts right, you guys are capable Go. of, we might actually see the Jamaicans win an Olympic medal. So this is it. We could see history in the making. Feel the rhythm. Feel the ride. Get on up. It's bobsled time. How many of you remember the movie Cool Runnings? Well, I certainly do. It was, after all, a big Hollywood hit. And I'm so delighted that we have on this virtual episode of The Trailblazers, Devon Harris. He's the author of this book, Keep On Pushing, Lessons From Cool Runnings. And I'm excited to hear from him his journey growing up in the inner city community of Olympic Gardens to making it to the global stage and beyond. Hi Devon, oh my gosh, it is a pleasure to have you joining us on The Trailblazers. You of course are a trailblazer of being a part of the original Jamaican bobsled team. Welcome. Hey Tamara, it's great to be on. Good to see you again, how are you doing? I am great. And okay. just for the purposes of our viewers, I met Devon several years ago when you came to Jamaica and you were, because you live in New York and yeah. of course he was promoting his book keep on pushing and it's just a lessons from cool runnings don't yes. forget that part <laughs> lessons lessons from cool runnings definitely yeah. so i mean it's a pleasure to have you joining us so let's just jump right in i mean many may not know that you grew up in you know the inner city community of olympic gardens tell us about that yeah man i'm a bad man from ronto <laughs> 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 Yeah, I grew up in, uh, you know, in Waterhouse, uh, right on Sunrise Drive there. You know, I attended Jews Avenue Primary School. And it was back in the, you know, back, you know I came up here during the, in the late 70s, early 80s, just as Jamaica was kind of turning the corner in terms of the political violence was just kind of kicking in. And I just, I remember just uh, moments of being scared, you know, especially back in 1980. Um, but you know, I, I don't want to give the impression that I lived my life in total fear. Um, but there were some scary moments. I nonetheless had fun. You know, I enjoyed school. I enjoyed sports. I played football. Um, uh, you know, and then when I was in high school, from went to Arden, of course. Um, and of from, course. So, yeah, of course. Come on, you, you know, some my chest, uh, big. Uh, but. <laughs> You know, from third form until sixth form, you know, Tamara, I spent six days a week in school because that was, school was my haven. And that was a place that allowed me to kind of stay away from the old neighborhood and just, you know, stay, stay focused on the goals that I had. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So how is it that you ended up, because you were a captain in the JDF, you were in the Sanders Royal uh, Military. So how is it that you made that transition from, you know, being... There's a stereotype, unfortunately, that goes with living in an inner city community to being a part of the army. You know, um, so I grew up uh, always wanting to be an army officer. That was the thing that, one of the things that drove me throughout high school. And what, what I can say is that the selection process to get into the JDF as an officer, um, incredibly rigorous, but as far as I know, it's one of the fairest systems that are out there. Like nobody knows anything about you, except so you, except what you bring to the table during those uh, three days of incredible testing. And so I guess I was able to prove my mettle there, mm -hmm. um, show that I had some potential, and yeah, got you know past the selection board. I was actually the top pick of 33 people who tried out that during that time, and. As luck would have it, they, they sent this little youth from Waterhouse to Sandhurst. Go figure. Amazing. But why is it though that you decided to go down that path as opposed to any other profession? You know, I blame my grandmother for that. You know, I spent my early years in um, a little district called Haunton in St. Elizabeth. And my granny was an amazing storyteller. And one of the stories she told were about soldiers and um, 
and the amazing things they could do and not get injured like they could jump in a gully and don't brought them foot in. I'm not like, you know, I don't know if I could do that, but I want to do that. The, the most important thing about the story she told me though was, was that she got me to believe that there, that I could pursue things that were deemed as difficult or impossible um, by others and, and succeed at it. And so um, with that, you know, I wanted to be a soldier. And then when I grew older and I realized you could enlist as an officer, which was seen as more difficult, hey, why not? That, that was the thing that I wanted to do, so, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, I mean, one of the major things why our viewers are tuning in is to find out how is it that this army man ended up being a part of the original Jamaican bobsled team? Tell us yeah. about <laughs> So So the next goal I had tomorrow was, was to compete in the Olympics. And of course, you know, Jamaicans know that everybody in Jamaica sprint fast. I wasn't one of them. I was a middle distance runner. Um, but I had this dream of, uh, again, competing in the Olympics in 1984 as a high school student. You know, and I went to Arden, you know, how our sports program go there. Fell woefully short of that. Um, ended up in the army right after high school though. And so now fast forward, it's 1987. The Olympics are coming up in 88 in Seoul, Korea. And I'm thinking, you know, I've achieved this dream of being an army officer. What's next? And I'm like, oh yeah, the Olympics. I would get up every morning, you know, to go run five miles before it was time to report for duties. I'm thinking maybe I could get fit enough to qualify for the Olympics in Seoul. And run about that same time, two Americans came up with the idea to start a bobsled team um, because you needed sprinters, uh, you know, to start to push the sled. But they couldn't get any other guys on the summer team to do it. So they came to the army looking for athletes. And my colonel thought he'd send his young fit officer to go to the team trials. And I mean, I'm just not the kind of person who's gonna turn up at the team trials um, because the colonel told me to go and, and just be there as an also run, right? So I didn't think I was fit enough. I knew I was what I call army fit. I could walk 100 miles with 50 pounds on my back and a rifle in my hand. But I don't, I didn't think that was sports fit. But I went and I, I mean, I was, the, I didn't know I was going to make the team. I just knew I had to make the team. And I just, I tried my darnest. And what do you know? The rest right. is history. But, <laughs> you know, going, going to a bit more details, tell us, what was the training like for you? I mean, imagine you are from a tropical island and you are preparing for a winter sport. Yes. <laughs> we don't have snow in Jamaica. So what was the training like? The, the wonderful thing about bobsledding is that you don't have to be born on ice, as it were, right? Unlike skiers or figure skaters or so on, right? Most of, you're, you're basically taking skills that you learned and developed in other sports. Um, and bringing it to bobsled to certainly for the start. Um, so we spent, the team was selected in September 87 and we spent that time until mid-October um, in a park camp with a, a, a sled on wheels, a makeshift sled and it was too light to put, you know, stones in it and big pieces of metal, uh, you know, we're just, by the way, if I could digress a little bit, lost uh, one of the uh, one of the very first guys who got selected he yeah. never make it to, made it to the olympics but samuel clayton sammy mm -hmm. um was in camp with us you know six hours on a saturday morning three hours on a, every afternoon during the week pushing this thing um quite frankly doing everything wrong <laughs> we discovered later but that's how we trained <laughs> um <clears throat> um and, but, and that's not real bobsledding, by the way. That's just, you know, yeah. pushing a sled. But then we eventually went to Calgary and we went down a bobsled track for the first time in mid-October. So um, Sammy and I were a team. Sammy was a driver. And, uh, you know, you, when you're just getting started, you start from the halfway up, half mile. And it feels like you're flying, but you're probably only going 30 miles an hour. And wow. uh, I was scared to death. But I remember by the, by the third run, we did three runs at night. By the third run, I'm screaming in the back, go, Sammy, go, Sammy, go. Um, I, I was scared to death still, but hooked on the sport. 
Um, okay. so, yeah, so that's how we trained and, you know, ended up in Austria, did one race and we went to, um, came home for Christmas, went back to Lake Placid in the month of January 88, uh, mm -hmm. trained there for the month and then we went to the Olympics. So it really was no, not a whole lot of training or experience under our belt. Not a whole lot of training, but I mean, everything was captured of course in the hollywood blockbuster <laughs> the hollywood yeah. hit cool runnings which to date is a classic i mean everybody knows about cool runnings was the movie in any way because you know sometimes movies sometimes digress a bit from what actually happened was the movie for the most part accurate yes you, you say digress and that's very kind of you um <laughs> you know the, i think at the end it says based on the story or based on the true story of the Jamaica bobsled team. I think they, they needed very loosely based on the true story. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are certain facts. Obviously, there was a team. We had uh, issues getting funding. We did compete in the four-man, and we crashed. Um, but that's kind of where the similarities end. I tell you this, though, that in some respects, the, the true story is even more remarkable than the movie so for example in the movie it suggested that we trained as a four-man team from the very beginning the truth is that we never did four-man and until the week of the olympics you know chris stokes um who was the guy on the very back the great man he wasn't on the team at the start of the olympics it was during that week the second week of the olympics when they having the four-man event you know, what I call the Jamaican-ness came out of us. And we go, hey, we should do four months so we can all win our medal. We go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we recruited Chris that week. And in three days, we taught him everything we knew about pushing a bobsled. Amazing. Yeah, and then so we came off the hill. Definitely. What's that? that? Definitely is much more, you know, yeah. crazy. crazy. I, I mean, I think if, if that was in the movie, people would think it's corny. Because, you know, three, three days of training, Mm -hmm. And then we came off the hill with the seventh fastest start time on the second day of the, of the race. What was the feeling like being at the Olympics? This is a sport that's completely new to you, new to the team. What was the feeling like just having the world, you know, the eyes of the world on you in that moment? Well, there, there's so many. So, so imagine that you grew up watching the Olympics, right, on TV, and you see all these men and women marching in the opening ceremonies, and you're thinking, wow, those are some of the best athletes in the world. And then one day, you are marching in the opening ceremonies. You walk in the stadium, more cameras than you can count, I promise you. You know, 30, 40, 50,000 people screaming. And because of your previous experience, you know that in that moment, you are on TV all over the world, right? It's like, that's an example of you living the dream in that very moment, right? And then, you know, competing. I mean, there's not, there's no greater honor, man, than to represent your country, right? And here you are at the Olympic Games. And we're, so we're doing that and we're competing as fiercely as we can. But we're also in learning mode because we just got started in this thing. The Olympics was our first major race. You know, so we're there. And when we weren't getting ready to go down the track, we're, we're, we're out there watching other teams, just trying to pick something up. Uh, my friend from Australia posted a couple of pictures on Facebook. And there I am in the back watching them, right? I watched everybody. The best teams are not so good teams. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're... We, you have what you call a warm house, this place where we hang up before we go warm up and go down the track and everybody just, the warm house is a beehive of activity. Mm -hmm. And so you're sitting there and taking it all in. Like, like so, cause this, the Olympics are the first time we're seeing the major players yes. in the sport. And it's kind of like going to the NBA final and you're for the first time you're seeing LeBron James and Kevin Durant or, you know, it's, it's crazy. So yeah, we're we're learning, we're competing, and we're a little bit in awe. Like, oh, that's Wolfgang Happy, huh? You know, just taking it in, man. It was, um, and then of course the attention. It was flattering and distracting at the same time. And distract at the same time. Yeah. Overall, you would say it was mind blowing. What do you think, though? Because you mentioned in terms of the sport itself, we saw recently where the Jamaican female bobsledders were making their own attempts what do you think do you think we jamaica has advanced where the, you know you know where bobsledding is concerned where and are you concerned about the future of the sport 
Good question. So um, I'll tell you the truth. I, I think we have we have grown. The knowledge base is significantly more, obviously, after 30 years. You know, we have some, you know, Wayne Thomas, for example, I, I call him like our resident um, mechanic, sled mechanic. The guy can pull down a sled and put it back like there's nothing. Um, so it's very, very knowledgeable uh, on sled maintenance and mechanics. And obviously he's a, a IAAF uh, certified coach as well, top coach, so really knowledgeable. Um, but I, I, I think from an administrative point of view, man, we are lacking. We are, you know, we have dropped the ball. I, I still believe that we have tremendous potential. I think we can, you know, it's not... I'm not being delusional here. I, I think if we do it right, we can win a medal at the Olympics. It's not going to be the next one or the one after that, quite frankly, because I don't think we're close to it in terms of just the organization that we need um, and the habits and practices that we need. But we have the talents, man. We have the talents. We definitely have the talent. And just to zoom in the focus back on you, I mean, you obviously have made a name for yourself after, you know, the, your bobsledding days. <laughs> well, I don't know if you still do some understanding. <laughs> but you have made a name for yourself, you know, being a, a, an inspirational speaker. And I'm privileged to have your book, Keep On Pushing, Lessons From Cool Runnings. So tell us a bit about this book, why you decided to write it. You know, it's it's kind of funny as as we because we started out talking about you know my growing up and me you know attending Arden and so on. And I tell you this: when I was in school, and teachers always say, "Hey, when you write an essay, you must read it over before you submitted it." I never did. It's like, why would I need to read it over when I just wrote it, right? <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> and what this was such a waste of time, right? And you know, and uh, I'm 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 amused at, at you know what I do now. I write speeches, I write articles, I write, I've written a couple of books. I'm actually working on another one right now. Wow! Um, is this I, is this an exclusive? You want to drop the name or anything? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, just, no problem. Just, we're not. We're just walking up to the start line. Okay. <laughs> but but you know, using the downtime to to be productive. But yeah, so it's just kind of interesting how. I mean, it's such a intensive effort writing a book and writing and rewriting and reading and rewriting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just, I you know, well, we all, we all know how popular the movie is, and I, and I love the movie for the the lessons, the, the the life lessons that it shares. And so I wanted to kind of talk about those lessons as, as it relates to my life growing up in Waterhouse and coming through the army and and Bob setting and just, you know, provide, uh, you know, a book that would uh, inspire and, uh, and motivate people to be and their motivate. best as well. I was actually searching just now to find that page where you talk, you, that chapter, chapter three speaks to six ways you can keep on pushing. You remember any other six out of your head? Mm. So yeah, so yeah, share me now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, actually, the first one, you said pursue excellence. Why is that important? Because uh, the Blazers is all, is, you know, it's about giving, it's not only inspirational stories, but it's giving persons that blueprint for them to follow so that they can become successful as well. You know, with, if I could give some background to that, um, and hopefully not to be too long-winded. So, you know, at Arden, and I was running our boys champs in... 1981 that was it and my goal was to win two medals and break one record 800 and 1500 meters and i determined that if i for somehow sense that i wasn't going to win i was going to jog i don't want silver i don't want bronze i want to finish out of the frame if i'm not winning gold and that really in inspired me motivated me to train hard um and i go to boys champs and the 1500 was uh jesus just a disaster um, guy took my spikes off it ended up on the cycle track and Einstein runs over there to go get the spikes anyway so so I made the, the 800 meter finals and the race is going well um, 
this guy elbow me on the last, just as we start in the last lap. As I'm coming around, I see two guys make a run for it. And I go, oh, there they go. They're gone off to win my medal. And tomorrow, I started to jog. I jogged the last 300 meters of the race. But somehow, I convinced myself that I was in last spot, last place. The last guy passed me about 50 meters from the tape. And so the painful lesson I've learned is that you should pursue excellence, not perfection. Um, because you, as human beings, we are by nature imperfect beings. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the truth is that when you pursue perfection, perfection is, is ungrateful. It's, you, you could never do enough to be perfect, right? You'll, you'll move mountains and perfection will say it's not enough. Um, but you know what you can do though? You can give up your absolute best every time. That's what excellence is. Yeah. Just just giving up your best. Like, you know, in primary school they tell you only your best is good enough. Okay. Hey, if you if if honestly man, you, you know I don't think we realize the, the how much inspirational messages we were getting when we were growing up. Um but if we just strive to, to give up our best every single time and everything we do, we'll be okay. That's excellence. And like that is amazing. And I just wanted to touch on another point that you had where you said persistent pace. Yeah. How critical is persistence? Yeah. It's, a, it's a thing you keep on pushing. Um, yes. it is so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many people who didn't succeed just because they gave up. They gave up. I mean, the, the thing is that we set our goals and we are all excited and enthusiastic and we set out and we, we hit a little bump and we go, oh, it's a little bump, let me keep moving. And you know, and as you go along the journey and the bumps become more and more frequent and bigger and bigger, you start getting exhausted and more discouraged and you have to climb a hill or two. And what I, what I envision is that a lot of people, they'll get to like this one hill and they go, you know, I just can't make it anymore. And they stop. And if they had just gone over the hill, there's a goal, there's a prize, right? Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've just learned, man, just never to give up. Just, you know, successful people. Just keep on pushing. Yeah. So here's the thing. Successful people actually do give up, you know. They give up on the strategy, not the goal. So in other words, if they're trying this one thing and it's not working, then try something else, right? They try a different strategy. The goal remains the same. And then, then they keep on pushing until they get there. Indeed. I, I really like that point because a friend of mine loves to say that there, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Every so, single time. You yes. better believe it. So the goal Sorry for the cat, though. Sorry for the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the goal remains the same, but, you know, the strategy May yeah, change. the strategy the change. remains the same. Mm -hmm. That is indeed amazing. I mean, we referred to your former team member who passed away, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. of COVID. And it's a rough time in the world for many. How do you think persons can, you know, apply some of the tenets from your book and just from your inspirational messages and what you do? So dealing with the situation that we're facing now globally. Yeah, you know, uh, really good question because I think, you know, as, as human beings, we are creatures of habit and we love certainty because certainty gives us a sense of comfort and security and safety, right? And, um, you know, when you have things happening in our lives that throw us off balance, you know, that like COVID-19 throws us off balance, um, we we have a tendency to want to hold on, like to just grab on and, and tooth and nail and to, to maintain control. And um, I equate that to driving a bobsled. You know, I became a bobsled driver after 88. And when you're heading down a track, every now and again, you're gonna get in trouble. The sled is going to miss what we call a take onto the corner. You're gonna be all over the place. And the natural instinct as, because we're human beings, is to like grab the sled and try to force it to, to get to where you want it to go. And it's the wrong thing. All you do is make it worse. Um, in those moments, I describe you know, myself as my eyes getting as big as my fist. And 
you just you just have to relax you just have to breathe and 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 can allow the sled to go with the flow until they get to that point on the corner where you know you need to be then you're at and i think as we go through this man uh you know we have to yeah kind of breathe a little bit we really need to take a deep breath and um recognize what the situation is what the facts are you know don't paint a rosier picture than they are or a darker picture than they are just accept the facts um as they are because when you do that um you're able to then navigate your way through the facts so i think that's the first thing you know just you know to kind of learn to deal with you know the uncertainty that this environment is producing um and the, the, the other challenge with this is that we don't know where the end is we don't know when this thing is going to end and you know i tell people you should keep on pushing well how do you keep on pushing when there's no end in sight yeah. um and my question is like do you have a choice um yeah so i well that's how i speak to myself mm-hmm. uh, you know so i i see it as you know I tell people you begin with the end in mind and they go well how are you going to do that when when you don't know where the end is i'm like well you're going to what you want to do is visualize what the end is going to look like for you when you get through the end of this when all of us eventually get through the end of this crisis what will that look like for you what would you like to be doing because that is going to determine what you're doing now right um you know so if i i'm thinking well you know things have slowed down i'm not traveling i'm speaking but maybe i can spend some time writing a book you know i don't know the book will be end where well, i'll finish the book by the time uh, this thing ends but you you do something right you know so I, i use the analogy of you being in the middle of the ocean and you in your mind you know the shore is over there somewhere what do you do you keep rowing stroke after stroke although you can't see the shore for the life of you you know it's over there somewhere and if you just keep on going keep on rowing one row at a time you'll eventually get there and you'll be okay thank you so much i just have one last question and that's just for others looking on other young men who grew up or in the inner city because you were raised in the inner city but you have come out to be a more than a success and so what's your message to those individuals they want to make something of themselves but the odds seem to be against them it's challenging and i know and i imagine that is even more challenging today than when i was growing up but you have you have to learn to move to the beat of your own drum you know in other words you, you need to do what you want to do and not what everybody else wants to do you know? so when i was growing up and They're like hey we're going over here i'm like oh okay fine i'm over here <laughs> i'm going to be over here if you want to hang out with me right you you what's a, oh the a, a guy was watching actually I, i know who he is and i'm not going to name him but he says the friends you keep are the friends you keep you know, like your mother said you know, um birds of a feather flock together mm-hmm. right the friends you keep are the friends you keep so you have to be very choosy i'm not saying by choosy i don't mean snobbish right you don't have to pretend yeah. like you're better than other people because you know quite frankly we're not but you have to decide like you know what the things that you're pursuing the path that you're heading down is not the path i want to be down and and uh, you know move over and do something else I, i had to deal with that and you know ended up I'm not a violent man but you know bust a couple of heads just so people would get the get the picture and I know we live in a very different uh, environment but you have to be resolute you have to make it known through primarily through your actions which is why I spend most of my time in school um but sometimes you have to be vocal as well yo so over here to me I'm going on. so see you later Okay. And this is my last 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 question. All right. Final. <laughs> your final your final message to our viewers on the importance of keep on pushing. Oh, um the importance it, to keep on pushing. Actually. It is so important because it's not just about overcoming obstacles. It's it's about growth, right? You know, um we never stop learning. So you may not be in school right now. Uh you know, 
getting a formal education, but there's so much to learn still. There's just so much growth that each of, and every one of us still have to do. And, and so you have to keep on pushing, try to you know, learn to figure a way to improve the skills that you have or learn new skills. I mean, the world is changing around us. Um, and if you, you know, keep holding on to the way you've always done things and with the knowledge that you have always had, then you're, you won't be able to participate effectively in this new world. The skills and the knowledge and the experience, the expertise that you have now have brought you to this point. That's as far as it's going to take you. Indeed. Um, for you to move, be able to move on effectively, yeah, you have to keep on pushing. Uh, I love that. I love it. Thank you so much. Devon Harris, get a copy of his book, Keep On Pushing. We will put up his Instagram and his all of his social media information. We will have that. Um, it is so easy too. It's Keep On Pushing. And I went to the Olympics for the first time in 88. Keep On Pushing 88. Look at that. Okay, awesome. So it's Keep On Pushing 88. And yeah. I will have that information um, on screen. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Keep safe in New York as we are keeping safe here in Jamaica and you continue to keep on pushing. Thank you so much. I just want to tell everybody, hey, be wise and sanitize. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tamara Mikhail. I'm a television producer, presenter, and a writer.